Okay, on this video, we're gonna revisit an old topic that you all should be very familiar with, the chain rule. Um, the difference now is we're gonna talk about how the chain rule is applied when you have a function of more than one variable. Um, when we learned that before, it was just single variable calculus. So uh, things get a little more complicated, but it's not too bad. Okay, so I thought we'd start with an, a, an actual um, application problem so we can kind of see how this will be applied. So uh, it's a chemistry problem. So we have a pressure in kilopascals and the volume in liters and the temperature of one mole of an ideal gas, and many of you know the equation, are related by the ideal gas law. I think it's PV equals NRT, but if you have one mole, it's just PV equals 8.31 T. So let's say the temperature of our gas is 300 degrees Kelvin and it's increasing at a rate of 0.1 degree per second, and the volume is 100 liters and increasing at 0.2 liters per second. So we wanna know how fast is the pressure changing. I think it's kinda of probably worthwhile to think for yourself what you would expect to happen, right, with the pressure. If the temperature is increasing, right, that's gonna increase the pressure of the gas, uh, but if the volume is also increasing, right, you've got more space, so that would have the effect of decreasing the pressure. So, you know, which one's the stronger, uh, which one's stronger, I guess, is what, it, what it's going to come down to, which one affects the pressure the most. Okay, so here's how we're going to deal with this. The pressure is a function of temperature and volume. So it's, I just solved for P, and I wrote it as V to the negative 1, we'll see that might be useful when we take partial derivatives. But in this case, both the volume and the temperature are also functions of time. They're functions of another variable, right? And when we do the chain rule, um, I like this idea. There's other calculus books um, use this idea of a mapping to kind of help us set up the formula for the derivative. So we have the pressure, and, we, and the pressure ultimately is a function of time but the pressure is a function of the volume and the temperature, but both of those, as we saw, are functions of time. And so according to the chain rule for functions of more than one variable, if we wanna take the derivative of pressure with respect to time, if we wanna get from here to here, we have to go through our paths, okay? There's two paths that take us from P to T. The first one, let's go to the left here, and this would be read from here to here is the partial derivative of P with respect to V. That takes us to here, and then we're gonna multiply that from here to here is the derivative of V with respect to T. That's not a partial derivative because the volume was just a function of T. Every time we take a new path, so we went here and then here, we're gonna separate that with an addition. And so, and that could be thought of as, this is the temperature, I'm sorry, this is the uh, volumes effect on the pressure, and then we also want to include the temperature's effect on, on how the pressure is changing, so we're going to add those two together. Okay, so then here is the partial of pressure with respect to temperature, and then we're going to times that by the derivative of temperature with respect to time. Okay, if you work this out, um, your partial with respect to V, uh, remember that T is a constant, so the T just gets to stay there, and it's negative stuff V to the negative two. Then we times that by dV dt that was given. The partial of P with respect to T, V is constant, so we just get 8.31 V to the negative one, and then we times that by dT dt. So if we plug in now the given information, we had the temperature being 300 and the volume being 100. As we suspected, the volume, the fact that the volume was increasing had a negative effect on the pressure, right? That serves to decrease the pressure. Um, the temperature increase had a positive effect on increasing the temperature. And it turns out that the negative effect of the volume increasing um, had, a, had a stronger effect because this answer comes out to be negative, 0.04155 kilopascals per second. Okay, so now that's an application problem um, so that you can kind of attach as we just work with just straight functions without any 
um, context to them, you know, perhaps you could imagine doing a pressure volume temperature type of a problem, okay? So let's suppose for some other function, we have some other function, so no context here, but we know f is a function of x and y, we've got x squared e to the three y, but we know that x is cosine t and y is sine t, okay? Um, one example I thought right away here could be if another thing we will be studying later on is predator-prey models. So maybe this represents the population of the predators and the prey. And as you know, with populations, sometimes they, they're cyclical, right? They oscillate like a sine or a cosine function. Anyhow, suppose we want to find df dt. How is this function changing with respect to time? Now, just to be clear, you can do this one. We can do this one by first writing f as a function of t. We don't need to bother with the, well, the chain rule and the way we explained it on the previous page. So you could just substitute in, right? You could plug in cosine for x and sine for y, and you get a function strictly of t, and it wants the derivative with respect to t, so you would just take the derivative, right, and using the product rule. Okay, you can look that over. Make sure you know how to do it that way. But, but let's, so the advantage of the chain rule we'll talk about here, so that's a fairly lengthy product rule. If we do it more of the chain rule way, the way we did the previous problem, we could use our mapping. F is a function of X and Y, but both X and Y were functions of T. And so the derivative, if I wanna take the derivative of F with respect to T, I have to take my two pathways, the partial of F with respect to X times DX DT, plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt. Okay, and then I can, can work those out for yourself. Go back and review the video. That's your partial with respect to x. The derivative of x is the derivative of cosine of t with respect to t is negative sine. There's your partial with respect to y, and the derivative of sine is cosine of t. And what I wanted you to see was this has the same form of the answer, right? 2x e to the 3y is sitting right, it's kind of separated, but there's 2x e to the 3y, and then times your negative sine t is right there. x squared e to the 3y times 3, x squared e to the 3y times 3, and there's your cosine. It's the same answer. And, you know, why, why don't we just do it in terms of t? Well, what if we said you could just leave your answer this way, knowing that if you wanted to get this in terms of t, you could just substitute in, right? X is cosine, y is sine. So if we, if we allow ourselves to just leave it in this form, then I think hopefully you would agree that this might be easier than doing it strictly as a function of t. Okay, Let's more practice here. Now this works for many, as many variables as you have, okay? Here's some function w that's a function of x, y, and z, x times e to the y over z. And again, we have x, y, and z defined as function of functions of time. And we wanna find the derivative of w with respect to t. So my mapping is gonna have more pathways, right? Now I have three pathways. And to help us out for our derivative, I'm gonna rewrite the y over z as y times z to the negative one. So derivative of w with respect to t, my first pathway is the partial of w with respect to x. Remember for, if you have three variables, then you're gonna hold y and z constant. So the partial derivative of this with respect to x, derivative of x is one, all of this is constant, so it's just going to stay there. Now I did rewrite it as e to the y over z there. Okay, dx dt is two t. Okay, new pathway, so I separate that with addition. Partial of w with respect to y. Now I'm treating x and z as a constant. So x can just stay there, and the derivative of e to stuff is e to the stuff times the partial derivative of that with respect to y, meaning z is a constant. So the z to the negative one just comes down and the derivative of y is just one, right? Okay, dy dt is negative one there. And then finally, partial derivative with respect to z times dz dt. 
Now I'm holding x and y constant. So that once again can stay there. And the derivative of e to stuff is e to stuff. Now I'm treating uh, z as my variable. So um, y is a constant. So that can just come down and it's negative z to the negative 2. OK, times dz dt, which is 2. And we'll just leave it like that. <clears throat> OK. You can also have, so in addition to having more uh, variables that your original function is a function of, okay, here I have z is back to a function of just two variables, x and y, but here x and y are both functions of two variables. x is s squared, that's an s, <laughs> times t, and y is s ln of t. So now, this is why the mapping, I think, is so useful. If we want to find the partial of z with respect to s, then our mapping is z is a function of x and y, but x is a function of s and t, and same for y, right? So I've got an arrow going both of those places. The partial of z with respect to s, I want to take all the pathways that get me from here to here. So the first one here is the partial of z with respect to s times the partial of x with respect, with respect to s. Okay, this is an inverse tan, so the derivative of inverse tan of stuff is 1 over 1 plus stuff squared times the partial of the inside with respect to x. That's just going to be 1. And then the partial of x with respect to s, t is constant, so it's just 2st, plus I have this pathway, partial of z with respect to y. That's very similar to how I did this one except I'm going to multiply by the derivative of the inside with respect to y, which is 2, and then times the partial of y with respect to s, which is just ln of t. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe try, pause the video and try to do the partial of z with respect to t and see if you can get the answer. So here's your answer. And you can pause the video and check that. Okay, let's try another one. Um, actually, on this one, what I want to show you is the chain rule can also be used. So one application of it is it can be used as a shortcut for implicit differentiation. Okay, here's an equation from 17a where we're asked to find dy dx. And let's review the 17a way first, okay, first quarter calculus. Remember then what we were doing is we were treating x as our variable and we were assuming y was a function of x, right? And so what that meant was the derivative of x cubed is already with respect to x, that's 3x squared. And when you take the derivative of a y term, you do it the normal way, which was 2y, but then we had to multiply by the derivative of y with respect to x because we're assuming y was a function of x. Then you need a product rule. So the derivative of x is 1 times the second, and then you leave the first there, and the derivative of e to the y is e to the y times dy dx. We are taking the derivative of both sides, so the derivative of 7 would just be 0. And then, as you recall, you're just doing some algebra. So I'm, I'm leaving these two terms, they have dy dx together, and I'm taking the ones without dy dx, moving them over, and factor out your dy dx, and then divide. Okay, so we get this answer. <clears throat> now, ultimately, we're not going to be doing it the 17a way, so I don't, you don't need to stress about trying to go back and figure out how to do this. I mean, it's good to know, but I, what I wanted to convince you of, we're gonna get the same answer, so remember this answer, but we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to do it using the chain rule, and it's gonna be a shortcut. Okay, so using the chain rule, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna imagine that same function, we're gonna move the seven over and set it equal to zero. I'm going to call it capital F of xy. And then we're going to take the partial derivative of f, the partial derivative of with respect to x of both sides. And so here's the way, here's the mapping, okay? So clearly f, big F, is a function of x, okay? And I want to take the derivative with respect to x, so I'm just going to have one arrow going there. 
f is also a function of y, and as we know, we're assuming y is implicitly a function of x, right? f is a function of y, and we know y is a function of x. So if we want to take the derivative with respect to x, then we need to take both pathways. The first one is just simply, and I'm just going to denote that as f sub x, plus f sub y, and then this is dy dx. Of course, the derivative of 0 would be 0. Now, if I solve that for dy dx, that's, that was our goal. It's very simple. I just move the negative f sub x over, divide by f sub y. And so what we have, this is our shortcut. The, part, the derivative of y with respect to x is just the negative of the partial derivative of this with respect to x divided by the partial derivative with respect to y. So this could be very easy, okay? Using this formula, I would just look at this and say, what's the partial with respect to x? That would be 3x squared. If we're treating y as a constant, that would go away, right? x times e to the y with respect to x, that would just be 1, and this would just come down. And then I divide it by f sub y. Now x is a constant. That goes away. This is 2y. x is constant, stays there, and the derivative of e to the y is e to the y. And notice, if you turn it back to the page before, that's the exact same answer we got in a much simpler way. OK, so why don't, let's try this. Here's another equation x to the third, y to the fourth equals 1 minus x cosine y. And I'll get you started here. So what you want to do is move everybody over to one side and set it equal to 0. And then you're going to take the partial derivative of with respect to x of both sides, and this formula is still going to hold true. So go ahead and use this formula to find dy dx. Pause the video, because I'm going to show you the answer. And you should get that. Now, this idea of using um, the chain rule to shorten up implicit differentiation can actually be extended. Say I have a function of three variables, x, y, and z and I want to find the partial of z with respect to x, which means I'm going to be treating y as a constant, okay? So I'm going to do the same strategy. I'm going to call this function a function of x and z. Remember, I'm treating y as a constant. I'm going to move everybody over, and I'm going to take the partial with respect to x of both sides. And see, the, the mapping is pretty much the same, right? f is a function of x and f is a function of z, but we're, we know z is implicitly a function of x, right? Or is, is a function of x. And we don't have y in there, again, because it's constant. So using the chain rule, you get f sub x plus f sub z times the partial of z with respect to x equals 0. And if you solve for the partial of z with respect to x, you get negative f sub x over f sub z. It's important to remember when you do these partial derivatives, you have to, OK, we are going to treat both f sub x, we're going to treat y and z as a constant, right? And for f sub z, x and z as a constant. And so if you do that, you should get this result. Okay.